power of Salesforce. That was when I truly understood Salesforce could do a lot, a lot more than I initially thought it could. And so the applications that it really had in this instance, particularly in this clinical trials technology company, you know, understanding how we could use that information and collect data became incredibly enticing to me. And I'm sure to all of you too. And that's probably why you're saying, hey, Salesforce is pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I love that you were just told, hey, you own Salesforce. Surprise. That's amazing. How it was it a feel, surprise. <laughs> how does it feel to be the new owner of Salesforce? Come on, share the wealth. <laughs> Honestly, and I think that's one of those things where, you know, so many people are introduced to Salesforce um, in an accidental way. And when you ask people, how did you find Salesforce? It's always some sort of like long convoluted story where you're like, wow, incredible. We all came to it in a different way. But one of the things that I think is the most powerful thing about Salesforce is everything you've done up to this minute is going to make you amazing at Salesforce. I love that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think that uh, just finding the ways that we're getting to where we're going and 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 where we've come from, uh, that it all leads somewhere. Um, so you're right. Everyone's story is so fantastic. So you you're now the president of, uh, of of this company. Now this is yours, right? This is your baby. Okay. So tell us about how did you go from being given the ownership of Salesforce in this company to being the the head honcho of cloud solutions. So I was working for this company that was doing patient reported outcomes and we got acquired by a company that was doing cardiac safety. Um, so essentially they were just doing, they had a central lab that was doing everything you would do with cardiac safety to make sure the drugs were not acting in a way that would make your heart do things that you don't want it to do. And um, around the same time, they acquired a company that was doing um, respiratory efficacy. So we had these three kind of companies that were doing things that were separate in clinical trials. And we all had our own instance of Salesforce. So we were integrating our instances and looking at our sales pathways and our sales motions, integrating those. And then that company kept buying other companies. So we were buying clinical data companies. Um, we were integrating and moving into clinical practice. And so one of the things that you know I realized is we can create a punch list. You guys are all familiar with punch lists, right? So every time that we were looking at a new company, we would say, here are the things we have to evaluate. How are they doing this in Salesforce? How many custom fields? How many custom objects? What are the ways that they're integrating, you know, marketing automation? Is their ERP integrated? And so I started really digging into Salesforce and saying, help me out here. You know, what can we do? Do you have a best practices for integrating orgs? Are there ways that people do this? And they were sort of like, hey, we'll put you in touch with our internal sales ops people, but there's not exactly like a punch list that says, here's what to do. And so I put it together and said, let's tell more people about it. So I spoke about it at World Tour. I spoke about it at Dreamforce. And then people started waiting for me in the hallways afterwards saying, can you help my company with this? And I did until I ran out of PTO days. And that was when I said, <laughs> I think I better make a business out of this. So that was that five was years fun. ago. We're celebrating our, our fifth anniversary this summer. Congratulations. That's a huge accomplishment to, to take what you were able to find, find the niche um, and, and make a successful company out of it. That's excellent. Thanks. So you've Thanks. seen a lot. I mean, you started in Salesforce prior to Trailhead. So how did you learn the platform if there was no Trailhead? Woo, with a lot <laughs> of sweat, right? Because, yeah. um, you know, at that time, Salesforce did have a program where you could fly to San Francisco, spend a week. It was about 6,000 bucks and they would teach you a bunch of things. Um, that was, that was it. That was your option. Um, and so a lot of what I did was trial and error. So when people would say, can you do this? I would say, okay. And you guys know that feeling when you're trying to do something and you press that button and you're like, is it all going to explode? I exploded mm -hmm. things a lot of times. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now were there sandboxes? Let's ask that question. Sort of, um, okay. not exactly like there is today. <laughs> there were no free dev orgs, right? So it was almost like like Pardot still is, where you just learn it and say like, please don't break anything. Like I prefer not to lose my entire um, database today. Um, so there was a ton of that, and it, there was nobody else in my company who knew it. There weren't people who came with it. Where I think now 
you can put on something, you know, Salesforce experience required and people will answer that call in 2009, 2010. That wasn't the thing. So I did a lot of bugging. I did a lot of reaching out to people, finding people on LinkedIn and saying, hey, you don't know me. You've never heard of me. Can you help me do the thing? And so many people just said yes, which is amazing. I and I think that spirit is still pervasive in the ecosystem. Absolutely. I think, I think, uh, you know, we've got one of the best uh, Ohana spirits with us is Lori. Like she is with what she's done with the healthcare heroes. She's truly, um, you know, embraced that and really made sure that it's here uh, so much more than I think the healthcare uh, system has in itself. So she's, she's really trying to merge the two worlds, which is great. So when you started seeing that Salesforce was going to be in, an important player in the healthcare life sciences world, um, and you started to really take ownership of that instance in the company you were in, how, why did you do it? Not, not necessarily how, but why? I mean, obviously somebody said it's yours now, but like you could have said no thanks and, and walked away. What made you continue to move forward? I definitely had some dark moments where I would watch these beautiful demos, this art of the possible, you know, look what Coca-Cola does with Salesforce. And I would literally close my computer and say, there's no way I can come close to that. I can't do any of that. I'm so overwhelmed by that. And then I would walk away from it and come back the next day and say, I don't have to be Coca-Cola, right? I can do a little piece of that. And so I started looking for ways to find inspiration. And I will tell you back then, as still now, I think still now, there's not a ton out there in our field to say, oh, this is how somebody just like me in an organization just like mine is doing the thing. And then when I started seeing a little more, um, you know, I saw a demo about patient engagement for Eli Lilly. I probably watched that video. If it had a thousand views on YouTube, I watched it 999 times because I was like, how are they doing that? What are they doing? Freeze. What's that right there? Um, and so I really just became this like super dedicated student to say, if I see something that's working in FinServe, how would that work over here on the clinical side, right? How can we make that thing work? And I know that we're a small vertical for Salesforce, but I think there are a lot of things that are happening in other verticals that we can immediately apply. And so I just started thinking, how can I twist and turn this so that it will make sense for what we're trying to do here? Mm -hmm. That's great. So I want to pivot just slightly. I listened to the Salesforce admin uh, webinar that you did back in 2021 and, and really talking with Mike Gerhold about, um, you know, how do we pivot out of this, um, this pandemic and back into a real world uh, pre-pandemic now post. And so can you just chat for a little bit about what it really means to be in this golden age of an admin and, and what you're seeing now two years after that webinar or excuse me, that podcast that you did? Yeah. So, you know, for anybody who didn't listen to that, um, you know, my idea that now is the golden age of the admin, I think still stands. There has never been a time that admins have been needed more than they are right now. So if you think back to March 13th, 2020, the world shut down, everybody went home, you know, they didn't even pack up their lunch boxes because we thought, Hey, you know, we just need two or three weeks at home and we're going to flatten the curve. And um, <laughs> we all know it didn't work that way. But what I think happened was, and one of the things I think, particularly for people who are looking at this sort of tech layoffs that are happening right now, my opinion is, when everybody went home, there were a lot of companies that said, how do we service this? How do we service the people that are used to paper-based things, that are used to being able to look people in the eye to do meetings? You know, So what blew up? Zoom blew up. Salesforce blew up. ERP systems blew up. Ways to get people, Slack blew up, right? Ways to say, how do I integrate what I, I'm used to doing on foot? to online. And so you saw a lot of salespeople had to be hired to deal with that demand, customer success people as they were implementing those sorts of things. So this sort of right sizing that's happening right now in tech tells me, okay, that people have the technology that they need, but guess what, you guys, they still need help figuring out how to maximize it and how to optimize it. And that's where we all come in, right? So the, the urgency to continue to help people with their user adoption is still there. The um, idea that we still need to find ways to have digital shared experiences is still there. And so when we think about our importance really as admins, as developers, as BAs, 
we still have so much work to do because people took these harried processes or they're sort of paper-based processes threw them online and now they're saying whoop we need to fix that and so it's just an excellent time for us to all step back and say how do we make it so it's better for you whether you're virtual or hybrid I love that yeah it was such a great um podcast that you did with him and I really enjoyed listening to it so uh, we posted it in the in the chat here for everyone so that they can refer back to it so I'm really curious as to what you see, especially over the last couple of years, you know, coming out of this pandemic and, and the influx of admins coming up, um, but also the tech layoffs. So like all of these things kind of merging into this world that we're in right now. And where do you see Salesforce in the next 12 months, two years, five years? And, and what is your company doing to move all of this forward? Yeah, you know, one of the things that we've just been evaluating is the way that people are using Salesforce. And, um, you know, I know that you know, Annie, but my PhD research was really on uh, CRM user adoption. So how do we get people to use CRM? And when we look at the sort of theories that go beyond that, one of the biggest things is diffusion of innovation. So how do we spread an idea? How do we get a concept to become popular among a group of people? And I think that's one of the big challenges that we have now as um, people who are admins who, you know, one of the things that Mike Gerholt really popularized was the idea of Salesforce administration by walking around, right? Sabwa. Well, we don't do a lot of walking around anymore, right? So now I think it's setting up ways to have these informal touch bases where you can say to somebody, hey, pop up in your video right now, show me how you save an opportunity or show me how you're darting around the screen. What do you do every day when you're open your home screen and just being able to say, you know, did you know that you have this little assistant up here? Have you ever looked at that? Let me show you what that does for you. And I think, you know, especially if you've got fresh, clear eyes and you are a recent administrator, you're coming with best practices, right? And a lot of times people need reminded of best practices because what we did in the pandemic is said, hurry up and make it able for everybody to get home. So we went from that mobile first focus, which was huge, right? Right before the pandemic, to say, oh, you know what? Never mind. We aren't sending everybody out into the field with iPads anymore. How do we make things work better at home? And so now to be able to use those fresh, clear eyes and say, these are actually Salesforce best practices. Here's how you make these things work. That's what we've been spending a lot of time doing, right? We still have most of our clients are in clinical research or in clinical practice, telehealth, those sorts of places. And so what we've been saying is, okay, you did everything you need to do to hurry up and get online. Now let's make sure that it goes back to where it was supposed to be so that when Salesforce pushes these new releases three times a year, you can take advantage of them. Yep, absolutely. So you hit on a few different pieces and parts, but I think that the I think the biggest thing that as healthcare heroes we need to remember is, is really taking a step back and asking those important questions and making sure that our user understands that we're trying to get a better grasp as to what they're doing and that way we can improve it for them. Um, I think that's a huge piece that I've seen in, in my last seven weeks of my first role um, is just really making sure that you're catching that. And I think that we, we see that in the healthcare world when we are starting to ask patients like, well, what are your symptoms? Or um, even just asking families, you know, well, when did you start noticing that she was falling? Or, um, you know, just asking those probing questions, I think is what I always learned them to be called. Um, but really you're creating a user story and you're really trying to gain the, the bottom line here. It's like, where can, where is it started and where can we go from? Absolutely. Yes. And you totally, you know, hit the nail on the head, which is everything that you know as a healthcare hero is going to make you an even better admin than most people, right? Because you already understand how you're building that story and building a user story is so similar to building a patient story, right? Um, um, I can tell you, um, this is very exciting news, actually. I just got my first six month all clear. I spent a year dealing with rectal cancer, which was oh, wow. interesting and unusual, came straight from my 45 year old colonoscopy. So please get your colonoscopies if you are 45 and haven't had one yet. Um, but, you know, I could feel the way that they were building the story. You know, they're like, 
is there is there a difference between putting your machine in between you and I, creating a physical barrier? Am I more likely to tell you what my symptoms are when you've got that barrier between us or when it goes to the side of you and you're looking at me like a person and then turning and taking the notes? It's the same when you're writing a user story, right? Salesforce users, particularly people who are not necessarily, you know, technologically adept, they sometimes are embarrassed to tell you the truth, right? So sometimes when you're leading somebody through UAT, that user acceptance testing, and you say, click here and do this, what's the behavior? They might not actually know what to do. So you can use all of those things that you know about compassionate care and apply it to being an admin, and you will be the best admin on the planet. I love that. Yeah, that, I think that hits home on a lot of things of, you know, we. Lori and I have heard a lot of um, transitioning healthcare workers asking, well, how do I say what I've done in healthcare and how it's translatable into my Salesforce, you know, what I want my Salesforce career to, to be? And so can you speak a little bit more about what you as an employer would then be looking for if you were uh, hiring somebody, let's say hypothetically right out of the box, right? So fresh from healthcare. Well, I will tell you almost my entire staff is recareered. So almost everybody in my staff has come out of uh, the field. So they typically are not people who went to school for computer science. I've only got one guy who actually went to school for computer science and guess what? He worked in healthcare IT. So <laughs> um, <laughs> I think really that these are the best types of people to come in. And I will tell you my experience when I was working for that company that made a lot of acquisitions we kept acquiring their managed services contracts and they would have these people who were beautiful technicians, you know, probably really great at writing user stories and documentation. And they had no idea what we were talking about when we were talking about the clinic, right? They didn't know what sites were like. They didn't have any idea about the pressures, the time, the sense of urgency, the ability to, you know, turn on a dime. They didn't get that. And that was really challenging for me because I'm like, hey, somebody who's a beautiful technician but has no idea what we're faced with every day, they don't work for me. So one of the things that I think all the healthcare heroes have to bring is something that is exceptional, which is I have all of this experience in this particular subject matter and I know this technology, which for me is way more valuable than saying I know all this technology, but I have no idea how humans will apply it. Yes, the human interaction is crucial. I think that we find that we found that specifically throughout the entire COVID pandemic of, you know, how are we relating to everyone? And right. I think those of us in healthcare really had to um, stay on our toes. Literally. Yes. <laughs> yes. If you were not treating a patient, you were uh, as a nurse or a physical therapist, you were most likely also being their uh, uh, mental health provider, regardless of where you were because of everything going on. Right. And is that not the perfect segue to being in Salesforce, right? Because a lot of times we're actually being business therapists, right? There's a lot of business mental health here because we're asking them to expose their process. And most of the time it's not beautiful or perfect. You know, we're asking them to, to change their mind and do things differently on technology. And a lot of them don't want to do it. And so all of those things that you know how to do already when you're dealing with people, it's the same. Right. Yeah. Exposing vulnerabilities. Absolutely. In business and in healthcare. And I think that's a great tie in. Um, you know, I wish I had thought of that months ago uh, in, in discussing that uh, as I went through interviews. So uh, for those of you who are still interviewing, it's definitely a, a great way of uh, describing what your, your transition is. Um, Learn and, and being vulnerable in the interview, I think, is important as well and making sure that um, everyone knows that, that you're not just there to show off, but also to, to learn. So that's super helpful. So tell me a little bit more about this book that you wrote back in 2017. I know it's been a minute, but um, it's about time, how to do more of what matters in the time you have. I love that title and I feel like it's um, something that came to light. It's almost like you were foreshadowing, uh, you know, like it came to light of like everyone started with this COVID fear of like, oh gosh, I have to live. Like it's the last day of my life. Like the peanut right. cartoon says, right? Like, so how, how, how did this come about? Tell me more. 
Yes, for sure. And first I will say anybody who adds me on LinkedIn, send me your um, address. If in, if you're in the United States, I'll send you a copy of the book. Um, oh, wow. I, that's awesome. Yes. I'm happy to do that. So um, please do, please do send me, drop me a note in LinkedIn. Um, this book actually came out of me being really thoughtful about productivity and how Salesforce could help accelerate productivity, right? So not just be a business tool that was meant for management, because a lot of users feel that way, right? You'll hear people say, oh, Salesforce is just so everybody can keep, you know, keep track of me and what I'm doing all day long. And so I really started thinking, how do we couch it as a productivity tool? So as a user, how do I use it so I can do my job better, faster, and do more of the things I was actually hired to do, right? And so... I started doing a lot of investigation and research on time management techniques and time management principles. And one of the things that I found is they were all very prescriptive. And I don't know about you guys, if you've ever said like this thing works perfectly for somebody else, the chances it's going to work perfectly for you are pretty slim, right? That might work better for somebody who's an extrovert or might work better for somebody who's a morning person, you know, whatever the case may be. I found that there was not a time management technique that I thought, well, this would work across. And so I really started digging down into, along with my co-author, um, Sean McBride, what really allowed people to have more time. And it really boiled down to something pretty simple, which is one, you have to be able to say no, say no to the things that are not necessarily in your bailiwick or not your strongest things, right? For me at that time, um, this was when my child was in daycare and they would ask for, you know, can anybody come and help? Can anybody bake cupcakes? Not one single person on this call would want to eat anything I baked ever. <laughs> <laughs> so I found it was best for me to say, no, you don't want me to do that, but what can I do instead? You know, how else can I be helpful in something that's strong for me? So do you want an end of year slideshow on Google Slides? I'm your girl, right? So we really started to focus on the book to say, how do we make sure that this is small and succinct? Because if you want more time, you don't want to read 300 pages. And how do we make sure that it's something that people can read and say, ah, immediately I can, I can bring that back to, to something that will work for me. And so it's a really... It's not prescriptive. It's a quick read that tells you, here's some practices you can put in place that will help you to find more time. Nice. And so how would you uh, recommend that someone who's trying to pivot from, say, even those three 12 hours that nurses are doing or four 12 hours, um, how would, what is some advice out of this book that you would give them? Yeah. So I think one, the one that I think is the strongest in there is find an accountability partner, right? So find somebody who's going to be on your journey with you. That might be a mentor. It might be a person who's at the same level as you, somebody who's trying to study with you, somebody who will check in with you. And if it's somebody who's not doing Salesforce, find somebody you can trade with. So if you know somebody that says like, Hey, I'm trying to eat more of a plant-based diet, say, okay, great. Let's check in on each other once a week. You ask me how I'm doing with Salesforce. I'll ask how you're doing with your plant-based diet. Right. And so I think finding an accountability buddy is the number one thing, because as humans, we like to be like electrons and we like to take that path of least resistance, right? We don't make things hard on ourselves. We don't like to do that. And the best way to get that done when you're trying to change that behavior is to find a friend. Nice. Phoning friends. I love it. Let's bring it back. All right. So any questions from those who are on, uh, on the call? I haven't seen anything pop up in the chat yet. Laurie, have you? Um, not really mostly links, um, but yeah. feel free to unmute if you have any questions, guys. I do want to give a piece of advice, um, which Please is... Do. Use your dev org as your portfolio. So a lot of times um, you'll hear people who are getting new into Salesforce who will say, oh, you know, I did this work with a nonprofit. And that's good. That's good experience. But you want to have something to show. So many times I've been on interviews with people, even through the Talent Alliance, where they'll say, hey, check this out. And I, this is something I've been able to do. And they pull up their dev org and they showcase something that they've built that it can be fun. It can speak to your personality. You know, I interviewed a guy once who said, I love anime. And so here I've characterized every single anime show I've ever watched by building this custom object. So oh, wow. yeah. yeah, so, you know, have your dev org rep represent your personality and also have it act as your portfolio if you don't have any tangible Salesforce experience. That's a great, great feedback. Now, how do you feel about um, like building uh, a portfolio and what would you want to see in that portfolio? 
Yep. So there are certain things that you will study for your admin cert, or if you already have your cert, things that you have studied, like security, that's huge in the certification. It's not that huge in practice. So it's important when you do it, but it's not something you're doing all day long. You know what you're doing all day long? Responding to requests for reports and dashboards. So those are critical. Um, making changes in the org that you know will represent what that um, particular company needs. So building custom objects, um, reducing input from users. So flows, if you're into flows, those are the sorts of things that we hear all day long, right? So people want to be able to get information out of the system and make it easier for their users to use. So when you're thinking about your dev org, that's a great place to stay focused, you know, kind of anticipating what would somebody need. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, there's been a lot of conversation around what to use when creating a portfolio. And I love that you're simplifying into just be, just have it in your dev org. Um, would you love to see it built out into uh, user story videos would you elaborate that on that at all or would you just keep it simple i think keep it simple and one of the things that you cannot forget to do is to use that little help text that little question mark right um good documentation because a lot of times when you pick up an org that's got a lot of technical debt if i look at an org that's been around since 2012 sometimes you're like why did they do it this way and there's no documentation in there there's no guidance there's no there's nothing telling you in the information so that's a really cool place for you to show hey i know something that is going to be really critical to you dear hiring manager you're going to want to see that i know how to keep good documentation right so right. you know you don't have to build out sops but use those little prompts inside of salesforce because it's a great way to show i totally understand what you need in a technical audit for sure. And so when, when we're on the topic of documentation, obviously, as healthcare providers, we have done a ton of documentation um, throughout our healthcare provider uh, lifespans, if you will. And so what method do you typically prefer for documentation? So super good question. And I know you guys probably are incredible documentation. That's something I would definitely drop in an interview because nobody doesn't do documentation, right? I do documentation. Everybody on my team does documentation. We don't have a person that we say, you do the documentation. Everyone does it, right? So I think that's one of the things that you put as a soft skill on your resume. It's actually very technical. I'm really good at documentation. And so, you know, if you've got an example that you can put on a Google doc or, you know, Word doc that you can say, here's how I documented when I built this custom object in my dev org. That would be so impressive. If I saw that in an interview, I'd be like, you're hired. This is incredible. Yeah, I think we get caught up in building out the technical skills and, and showing those because we lack or we feel like we lack in technical skills when really, if we can show that we're excellent in the stuff they wouldn't normally see, like, how did I build this custom object? Um, yeah, that's huge. Great, great call out. So we did have a, a Mickey, Mickey, I'll come right back to you. I did see another question pop up. Um, this one comes from Krunval, uh, Krunal, excuse me. Um, is there any healthcare related project to volunteer is where I can correlate my healthcare experience? So not that I'm familiar with uh, directly. I know we've had this conversation within the Healthcare Heroes Town Links cohort recently um, and finding what makes you passionate? Uh, for example, I built out a uh, patient compliance app for physical therapy in my dev work. So um, if there's something, Kernal, that you can think of that would solve a problem in healthcare or something that um, is really something you are passionate about, that's what I would go to. Shannon, what is your thought on that? I agree with that. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about health cloud and there is, um, you know, there are health cloud uh, demo orgs in the partner learning camp. But here's my advice. Do not worry too much about health cloud because the reality is it works the same way as sales cloud. So if you can say, hey, look, you know, I'm a pharmacist. And one of the things I've been thinking about is how to track when people come in for their vaccine so that we can proactively call them and tell them to come back in for their boosters, build that out, right? That's going to be something that people will be really interested in seeing. I love that. Yep. Taking simple, simple ideas and making, putting them in the org. And I Mickey, think what's your, Oh, go ahead. 
I think a lot of the people who are thinking about building something to demonstrate their experience kind of tend to look at it in such a broad manner that they get overwhelmed, doesn't know, they don't know how to start because they're like, okay, it's uh, there's patients, there's drugs, there's labs. No, you can start with something small and just keep adding functionalities just to demonstrate. Focus on, let's say, one area and then demonstrate the automations, demonstrate the flows. How would you create, let's let's say you're able to create an experience cloud. How do you gather information from the visitors of that experience cloud and get them into your contacts and then you have some sort of automation that will email them or um, get, get you a task to call them, you know, in their phone number that they entered into that. Let's say you made a screen flow on a, on an experience cloud, something like that. Mm -hmm. Don't make it too too complicated. That yeah. way you have something to start with. I think it's easy to get bogged down in the data. It's easy to get bogged down in the records on the object, each line item. But um, you know, for those of you who are needing to build something and trying to contemplate uh, the what, think about the bigger picture. Don't hone in on the patient that you're solving the problem for. Think about the business side of it. They get to flip that look. Mickey, it's your turn. What you got? All right, thank you. Uh, Shannon, yeah, thank you for your time tonight. Um, the quick questions, I wanna hear your take on resumes when we're transitioning to, from healthcare to Salesforce. As you know, the Salesforce experience is minimal, but then we have you know, pages of healthcare experience. So I, I want to hear your take on how much of that do we offer in a resume of our healthcare experience? Because I've heard, um, you know, uh, different takes on that. I would like to hear your opinion. Such a good question, Mickey. You know, one of the things that we all have to be cognizant of is a lot of companies use HRIS systems where it's reading for a match, right? So they may have a job description and your resume and they'll compare them to each other and say, oh, Mickey's a 60% match, right? So first of all, I would say, not that you want to word stuff, but you want to look and say, does my resume reflect that I can do this job? So that's my first piece of advice is a robot's looking at this resume most of the time before a human is. But I think you want to think about those transferable skills and capture them in there. So you may have, and I've seen some CVs or resumes that have, you know, up top, they've got technical skills where they say, you know, Microsoft Office Suite, Salesforce, you know, those sorts of things. And then they've got a soft skill box. And that is incredible because when you are, you know, able to call out all of the things that you've got that maybe people who have never done what you've done don't have, that's going to be incredible, right? That's going to be really powerful because, you know, you, if you think one, like your ability to see things through in very critical situations and your ability to remain tenacious, those are things you definitely want to call out on your resume. So um, I would say, you know, that, that sort of old rule of resume should be one page. I don't necessarily agree with that, but I love to call out in the top, like, when people say, here's my technical expertise, here's my soft skill expertise, and then list where you've worked as social proof, perfect. Thank you. Just looking for any other hands up, not that I'm seeing. So um, are you still in uh, a part-time professor at the school that you graduated from at um I am. Yeah, what are you <laughs> teaching? Am. Tell us about that and, and how you got so, into it and what you're seeing um in your student body. It's it's interesting because right now we're seeing students who, you know, if they are in the first half of their college career, they spent a lot of time, you know, pandemic time in school. So the way that they approach studying and learning is different, the way that they socialize is different, and it's marked. A student doesn't have to tell me if they're a freshman or a senior, I can tell right away. And so, you know, just the approach on the education side has been different um, and interesting. In the fall, I usually teach a class that I authored called Technology and Innovation in Sales and Marketing. And you can guess what those students are studying. They're doing trailhead. And it's really cool for them because they're coming out of school with some experience and, you know, at least user-based knowledge of Salesforce. Um, I also have them doing some HubSpot Academy because one of the things that I've seen is a lot of folks use HubSpot for marketing automation and then integrate that with Salesforce. And then in the spring, 
I also um, teach a class called Advanced Professional Selling, and we spend a ton of time in Salesforce there as well. So the Salesforce Talent Alliance actually has a university arm that you know gives us a ton of information that we can share with our students so that they sort of understand like, what is CRM? Why would you use CRM? And um, it's really fun. And I think it's going to be interesting to see people who were exposed to Salesforce intentionally in an academic setting, as opposed to all of us who were exposed to it accidentally. Mm -hmm. I think that's definitely gonna be an interesting thing to see over the next five to 10 years as we, as we see that them come out of, of school and really develop into the, the career world. So um, great feedback there. So I'm not seeing any additional questions. I didn't have anything specifically for you. Lori, did you have any other questions you'd like to ask? I'd like to know what a typical day is like for you in your work, Shannon. <laughs> um, well, <laughs> I don't know that I have a typical day. Um, I'm still billable on projects. <laughs> um, so I'm working with a client right now, um, pretty closely working on their sales process. And they are in the clinical research field, very heavily involved in um, clinical trial data. I help my team focus on the things that they want to achieve. You know, one of the things that we all know about Salesforce is there are a massive amount of certifications. And I think a piece of advice I would offer to you all that I offer to my team is you don't have to have 65 certifications, but you have to be able to say, this certification proves that I'm an expert in this field, right? So, um, you know, if somebody's got 16 certifications and one is CPQ and one is marketing, I'm like, yeah, wh why though? You know, um, the certifications are to say like, I know what I'm doing, right? I'm, I'm somebody who can do this thing. Um, so I help my staff during the day say like, how are you focused on education? Um, I do some of the pretty typical business things that are not exciting to do, you know, um, compliance, paperwork, that sort of thing. Um, and I try to get really involved in training. So, you know, post UAT, when we're looking at how to train large groups of people, because that's my absolute favorite thing to do. I really love that. Well, um, I have a follow-up question on that since you mentioned about certifications and expertise. Um, you, well, recently there had been a, a kind of a debate about getting, you know, collecting certificates versus collecting experiences that will prove you are an expert in those certificates you're holding. What are your thoughts about the, that argument? Uh, so I think, <laughs> I think sometimes people who love to learn get cert certification because they're saying like, hey, I learned this, you know, this is something I learned. And I, and I would like to say like, look, you know, I dug really deep and I figured this out and I did everything that I needed to do to prove my expertise in this area. And that is wonderful and marvelous. You know, as a person who loves learning um, probably more than I should, I'm constantly listening to podcasts, you know, my poor family is like, take a break. I'm like, no, there's so much more to learn. Um, so that, that is great. I think that is respectable and I really appreciate it. But when I'm hiring somebody, um, it's typically for a need, right? We have to service customers who have a pretty deep need that they can't fulfill themselves. So, you know, if somebody comes and says, hey, I'm a certified admin or I'm a certified developer, these are the things that I know. Great. We spend most of our time in sales cloud and service cloud, right? So, you know, if you have experience somewhere else, that's okay, but I need to know that you can take these user requirements and do what the people need really quickly so they can get back to doing what they're doing, right? Because we're just trying to make other people's days better. Because mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of job seekers, you know, still very new at, at this time, and um, they're not too sure whether to try to acquire more certificates to be ahead of everyone else in the competition or would that make them kind of less attractive to potential employers looking for entry-level talent what can you say about that yeah so you you guys know better than anybody right one of the things that we're looking for uh, especially with clinical practice is outcomes right we want to be able to say these were the outcomes this is the outcome we're driving towards and so i would say when you're looking for a job using salesforce it's the same. What's the outcome you're looking for? So, um, you know, 
pretty standard that you're going one of two ways. You want to be an end user admin or developer, or you want to work for a consulting company. And so when you're thinking about what is going to be needed, wherever you're sitting, if it's end user or consulting, they want you to be able to say, I hear what my users need and I know how to do the thing. So when you're thinking about that outcomes or beginning with the end in mind, what's going to help you get there? It might be a mix of certifications, but most likely it's going to be based on the things that you already know that are going to be happening in your user's world that you can fix quickly. Ivy, feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. Yes, um, so I don't work in a technical role right now, but a while back, my company implemented Dynamics 365 to manage our projects. And when we started using it, I noticed that the default filters they had set up for us weren't working. It wasn't pulling up the projects as we wanted it. So I went in and I kind of messed around with the program a little bit. And I found a way to um, have the default view uh, set up so that it changes according to whoever that's using it. And I, I recorded a short training video I shared that with my team, but it was just like a one-off thing that I did. Is that something worth mentioning in an interview? I love this, Ivy, and I'm going to tell you why I love this so much. Um, there's a type of uh, interviewing that a lot of people are using now uh, called behavioral-based interviewing, where they will ask you a question, and the way that you should respond as a good interviewee is not, here's what I would do. That's like your representative, the person you send on a first date, but here's what I have done in the past, because the idea behind it is um, past behavior predicts future results. So the best way you can answer an interview question is say to say, you know, I did something similar to that one time before. Here's what I did. And so I think Ivy, if somebody says to you, you know, like, what are the, you know, good practices that you bring to Salesforce, you can say, I did something really similar to this in Dynamics, where I noticed there was something in the filter that didn't work for our users. I made the change, and then I recorded, I recorded a short video that was bite-sized and snackable. They could watch quickly, learn how to do it, and move on with their day in a way that worked better for everyone. So that's a beautiful way you can make that example. And you can do that, you know, your example doesn't have to be from Salesforce because they're hiring you, right? They're hiring the things that you bring to the table. So you can say, hey, you know what? I saw this one time um, in my daily job. It wasn't exactly Salesforce, but it's so correlated. Let me tell you about this story. That makes sense. Thank you, Shannon. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. Who else has a question for Shannon? We are almost done. Don't want to keep y'all too late tonight. I love it, Ivy. You know, I'll say like those types of things are huge. They're huge for people that are looking for help with Salesforce, right? Um, small videos, great, because the sort of like hour long training videos, nobody's going to watch them. They want to be able to refer back to one thing one time because many of the things that they'll do in Salesforce, they don't do that often. They're not doing them every single day. So they're short videos, perfect, right? And that could be a really good follow up after you've had an interview to say, hey, Here's an example video that I made of myself training something, you know, and show your dev org and make a quick training video if you think that's going to help push you forward to the next step. Actually, to follow up a little bit on that, um, I did a lot of that uh, kind of small training videos in my current role um, a while back. And that's when I realized I wanted to be in a more technical role. And then I went down this whole rabbit hole and that's how I found Salesforce. I love it. That's awesome. Ivy, you know, I think we all have this sort of like accidental story where we're like, this is how we found out about Salesforce. And, you know, last year's Super Bowl, there was that interesting commercial. I can remember watching it and there was like this, maybe it was two years ago, this font was running across. And I said to my husband, that's the Salesforce font. And he said, no, it's not. I said, it definitely is the Salesforce font. And then Matthew McConaughey started floating across as an astronaut. And I said, this is definitely a Salesforce commercial. And um, why it impacted me so greatly is like Salesforce is not, it's not a household name. This is a huge company, but so many people, when you tell them Salesforce, they're like, I have no idea what you're talking about, right? It's not like Target or 
Pepsi Cola. So, um, you know, I think when you find Salesforce, what drew you to it is also something really great to talk about in your interviews too, right? Here's why I love Salesforce so much. These are the sort of visions I had about it. And that's why they call it Dreamforce. They're inviting you to dream. How do you take this and make it elastic and make it really powerful for the people who are going to use it? Yep, absolutely. So what last words of advice do you have somebody who's newly transitioning? Yeah, I think my last words of advice are hang in there. I think a lot of times when I'm talking to people who are newly transitioning into Salesforce, they're like, oh, I've applied to a lot of jobs. And even though they say junior Salesforce admin, they still want one to three years of experience. How do I get that? That's a really common question. So I would say, you know, look around and see, are there any jobs around it that actually are Salesforce jobs that don't say Salesforce job, right? A lot of times you'll see um, project management, BA, um, business analyst, um, you'll see trainer, you'll see uh, enablement. And a lot of times those are actually Salesforce jobs that the person in HR who's writing it up doesn't know to say this is a Salesforce job. Um, and also don't be afraid to apply to those jobs that say one to three years of experience because they're saying that, they're writing it up saying they want it, but you know what you're coming with? You might be coming with 25 years of experience, right? It just so happens that you might have six months of it in Salesforce. Most of what Salesforce is, is an enablement platform to allow people to use it to do the things they have to do all day long. So if you already understand the industry and you understand the pains our users are going through, what you're bringing is the ability to customize Salesforce to fix their problems in a way nobody else can. That's excellent feedback. I think a lot of us have been through a ERN or a uh, electronic medical record system conversion in either a hospital or a clinic or what have you. And we know how painful they can be or, or how many clicks does it take to get to the one, the one click that finalizes your record that you're creating. So um, I think we all need to be more aware of what it is that we've done in our past and how we can really translate that out. Um, so what can we look forward to with Life Sciences Dreaming coming up in August in Fort Lauderdale? Yeah, thanks for asking. So excited about Life Sciences Dreaming. Um, it was just one of those things where we started talking to all of our customers and they were saying, we just don't get enough from Salesforce, right? Salesforce does these big, amazing demos on stage. And it's never about our industry. You know, we want to be inspired too. And so we started doing a little listening tour, asking people, what would you like to see? What are the things that you know? And a lot of times they were just saying like, we just want more of the art of the possible. So we're doing three small events in Philly, Boston, and in Research Triangle Park throughout the summer. And it will culminate in a two-day conference at the Marriott Harbor Beach in Fort Lauderdale. We're going to have a beach party the first night. It's going to be a good time. We've already received some incredible submissions, but are still looking for more. And, you know, keeping our fingers crossed that the big keynote speaker from Salesforce is going to be as recognizable to you as it is to us. Um, super pumped about that. So it should be a really nice time to get together with people who are are at this intersection of healthcare and Salesforce. Well, that's awesome. We're really excited about it. I know Lori and I have been talking about life science streaming for a, <laughs> a few weeks now, and we're, we're pumped about it as well. So we hope to see you there. Um, to anybody else who may have questions, feel free to reach out to Shannon, myself, or Lori um, on LinkedIn, as well as to join up with the Healthcare Heroes Force group if you're not already a member. Um, that is something that Lori can post a link to uh, because it is not something you'll find if you go to search for it in LinkedIn. So you have to have an invite for that. So Shannon, again, thank you for your time. Um, everyone remember about her book that she has posted. It is on Amazon. Um, it's about time, um, but she did say to drop her a line. And if you're in the US, she'll send you a copy. So thanks again, Shannon, for your time and the offer for the book and all of your advice. We really appreciate you. Thanks Thank for you having so me. much. I Shannon. appreciate all that you're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night, all. Good Thank night, you. everyone. Thank you. Oh, it really sucks. I thought I thought I hit the recording.